At the beginning of our last afternoon, I wish especially to thank those who have persevered with me <laughs> through the several hours of this exploration. Thank you. And of course, also those who have chaired the meetings and moderated uh, the times of question and answers. <laughs> I chose the, the introductory verse in the book of Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, chapter 7, verse 29. Only consider what I have found. God made humankind, Adam, upright, but they, they have sought many in this rare word may be translated in various ways, devices, some have said subtleties, inventions, the only other occurrence of this word, chishavon, is found in Second Chronicles 26, for siege machines, engines of war, the fruit of technical genius. <laughs> I'm persuaded there is a play on the root of this word in the passage at the end of chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes. For the word cheshbon, which is of the same root and very similar, same consonants, uh, and the Septuagint uses logismos in, in both cases, uh, is used twice before. It is, it is usually translated reason, but it is reason especially uh, on its uh, uh, calculating <laughs> side. Uh, reason uh, that can compute, <laughs> uh, that can uh, uh, also uh, edify uh, intellectual constructions, uh, that can follow chains of reasoning, and that may even use statistics, for in the same passage, Kohelet says that he has considered things one by one. <laughs> he gives us statistics in, in his manner, of course. He has not found one woman in 10,000. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think there is a reflection here uh, on the use, the value and the power uh, of reasoning reason. <laughs> and the passage starts with the affirmation that what is, is far, far to reach. Deep, deep, <laughs> beyond what we can really fathom. So um, I think this is an introduction uh, to uh, our work, in, especially in this first session this afternoon. We have gathered our tools in the previous uh, lectures. We have cleaned and sharpened them. And now we should carve out of the data an answer to the central question of our lectures. Was evil possible before it arose? If it was, how? Does what we say about it explain the reality of evil. This is the goal uh, which we had set for uh, our inquiry. Uh, can we answer these questions? I follow the, uh, this outline. Evil as a possibility for God first, and we shall uh, summarize things we have already uh, assessed. Human, evil as a human possibility, and then a third part which draws less and light on our path with question mark. <laughs> so evil as a possibility for God. As long as we carefully avoid insinuating some kind of reality into it, the purely logical possibility of evil, evil as the formal concept uh, obtained through the negation of the, book, of the good, I think we can accept that there is originally uh, and eternally 
a logical possibility of evil in God's eyes. As soon as goodness is defined, and it is by God's own being, he is the good one according to uh, our Lord's own testimony, then the negation of it, what is non-good, is defined as evil. And I think Thomas Aquinas correctly argues that God does know evil since he knows the good through the logical operation of negation. And this uh, I would maintain against, for instance, Jean-Michel Garrigue, who claims that God does not know evil, cannot foresee evil. He is blind to it because it is so alien to his nature. No, through negation, logically, God can know evil. And I would add that negation is rooted in God. There is no need of an ontological nothingness to ground negation, as, as you know, Heidegger uh, has suggested. Uh, in the divine trinity, difference, the difference of persons, is securely established, and thus the logical operation no. The Son is not the Father as a person. The Father is not the Son. And so we don't need anything else to ground the possibility of logically negating. But in, at that stage, in that negation, there is no reality whatsoever attached to evil. Second point, if we consider the relationship of the possibility, evil and God. Evil, uh, as of God's doing, this is impossible. Both really and logically, and I would say religiously, it is impossible, unthinkable. Uh, it is a thought we must uh, throw away with utmost energy. There is a breach of godly reverence in the simple thought uh, of God doing evil. And interestingly, I found in Kierkegaard's Sickness unto Death the statement that even saying that God does not sin is already blasphemy. <laughs> uh, of course, he goes a little too far. Uh, we still must do it, but you must understand his, his motive. Uh, just entertaining the thought that God could, even if we uh, say no immediately after that, this is already very dangerous. Uh, it is something which uh, may uh, already le lessen uh, uh, the, uh, the pure fear of God that must fill our hearts. Uh, this sensitivity I appreciate also in some Hebrew scribes, it's not strictly about sin, but about death. You know, you have in, in the Old Testament uh, a number of corrections effected by the scribes, and that they signal in the margins. Tikkun uh, Soferim, a correction of the scribes. In Habakkuk 1.12, the original text undoubtedly said, uh, of God you are from all eternity, thou canst die. That, that thou canst not die. Lo uh, tamut. But it was changed as a tikkun sofarim to we don't die. Lo <laughs> namutu shall not die. <laughs> See? Uh, so it's not the original text, but they thought it. It was not respectful enough, O oh God, to, to say, you, uh, thou, uh, canst, thou dost die, uh, uh, because it already insinuates, as it were, a possibility. <laughs> and this must be forbidden. Evil is defined by non-conformity to God. For him to do evil would be to deny himself, and we saw that this is ruled out. James 1, which we read the verse, you remember, uh, at the beginning of our survey, 
uh, rebuffs the ridiculous and perver perverse attempt to excuse oneself by casting the blame onto God. Because God does not tempt anyone. He's not tempted. Of course, this implies the polysemy of the, of the word to tempt in scripture, Nassau Peirazzo. And you remember that John counters probably proto or pre-gnostic propaganda as he stresses God is light with no darkness at all. Such, such texts make a strong bulwark to protect the statement I have just made. Yet we cannot close our eyes uh, on contrary evidence. Isaiah 45, 7, God said, I create evil, <laughs> darkness and evil. It's after all not too embarrassing uh, because, good, uh, because evil uh, may be understood as calamity, administered as a uh, well-deserved punishment. But there are other passages more embarrassing. You remember in Ezekiel 14, the false prophets are said to have been seduced by the Lord. And he judges them. He condemned them severely, but seduced by, by him. And Ezekiel 20, 25 following, uh, speaks of evil laws, including of children's sacrifice, as given by God. This unsettles contemporary readers. There is also the famous verse in 2 Samuel 24 with the Lord inciting David to sin and the parallel passage in 2 Chronicles 21 with Satan as the subject of the same verb in, in, in the same verse. So what are we to do uh, of such an, an evidence? I think the hermeneutical rule led, led down by Blaise Pascal uh, must be followed if we can. We must always seek for reconciliation of apparent contradictions, uh, if, at least if the author is, is, is worth reading. <laughs> and I think the, the passages are patient of an interpretation that understands these ways of speaking, quite typical of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was hyperbolic <laughs> in his style of uh, interpret them uh, as rhetorical devices, not to be taken literally, but to be understood as expressions of the sovereign control of God uh, over all what happens, even the criminal revolt of his creatures against himself. Mm. This clarification, of course, uh, which I uh, again emphasize that it is impossible for God to do evil and for evil to proceed from him, uh, of course, uh, it relies on our critique in past lectures uh, of the idea of metaphysical evil and of the tragic uh, dimension uh, of reality. We discussed these matters. Evil and God's plan. This gets more complex. Evil and God's design, God's uh, project, God's decree, as you may prefer to call it. Generally speaking, we know that uh, things are ultimately possible if they are included in God's decree. And in an ultimate sense, we said it, if they are not in God's decree, then they cannot happen. Uh, this is a, so what should we say about evil? How do, should we describe the relationship with God's decision? I think we should be aware of speaking too, too quickly of possibility. I may accept the idea that God's design, God's decree, is the possibility of possibility. Uh, but uh, it is not a causal element in, in a chain. Uh, when God intervenes, when God 
uh, executes his decree, his plan, then there is a reality. But as Turretin himself, from, from France, François Turtin, Francisco Turretin, yes, if I had to call his name, uh, definitely says in his critique of Molinism, we'll, we'll have a word about Molinism in the second lecture this afternoon, uh, in his critique, he says that things in God's decree have no existence whatsoever. It, they are only intentional. And this is different from uh, conferring a, a, an already uh, uh, ontological uh, uh, element coefficient uh, in, to, to these uh, realities. The relationship of uh, those evils that happen and the first introduction of evil is completely apart from all the chains of possibilities or other continuities we may uh, think of. We may say, uh, I think, and we already uh, touched on this point, uh, that it is not unthinkable that creatures should fall, should turn against their creator, uh, though sin is the absurd, the madness with no seed to make it possible in the makeup uh, of original uh, man and, and other creatures. Yet, we cannot say that it is impossible for creatures to fall and for free creatures to revolt against their creator, as it is impossible and thinkable for God to sin. This was, we must grant, I must grant to the tradition, to Augustine and to, and to, to Mons Aquinas and so on, that uh, it is not unthinkable. I prefer to say, as Karl Barth in the quotation I uh, read the other day, to say not impossible rather than possible. <laughs> it is not impossible that such creatures should revolt and so evil enter the world. But uh, if we say possible, we may suggest something of the kind of a, a, a weak spot. That was C.S. Lewis' expression. Uh, a crack in the, in the reality, something less than the superlatively good of Genesis 131 for reality as created by God. So I would say there is no real possibility uh, meaning features that could be described as a preparation uh, for uh, the emergence of sin, but it is simply not impossible. But God, God has decreed. God, in his plan, has included. Otherwise, he would not have chosen his elect for salvation before the foundation of the world. So uh, God has included in this, and this is antecedent. What should we say uh, uh, beyond what we have just said regarding this relationship? It is traditional to speak of permission, to say it is a permissive degree. By the way, Calvin is known for his critique of the word, in, in the Institutes especially, uh, because uh, to him, uh, at that time at least, it uh, uh, had the connotation of uh, an independent cause uh, escaping his control. But he also uses it positively, uh, with all explanations. But, if you see uh, his commentary on Genesis, <laughs> and precisely on Genesis 3.1, he uses the, the, the verb and the name uh, repeatedly in that passage. And he explains, of course, that it doesn't involve any loss of God's uh, sovereign uh, rule, but um, he, he uses it himself. My comment is that this is just a way to uh, point to the problem, not to solve it, to say 
a permissive degree, but at the same time, it usefully points to the non-symmetry between God and evil. And this was expressed in the Augustinian tradition and in, in Calvin's writings uh, with uh, the categories of efficient causality and deficient causality. Uh, in the case of good, uh, it is God who operates in human creatures, both the willing and the operation uh, of the good. Uh, of course, I'm alluding to the passage in Philippians 2. Uh, on the side of evil or, and sin, it is not the case. You don't have a symmetry there. It is not the case. The causality is deficient. Calvin writes, when man does good, God assists. But when God desists, then man does wrong. Man sins. See? Desist is the opposite of assist. It implies a withdrawal. And I think there are uh, hints in scripture that this is a biblical perspective. Uh, I'm impressed by what is said of Hezekiah's uh, fall uh, at the moment of, of his reign uh, in Second Chronicles, uh, again, uh, we have the statement uh, in 32, 31, we have the statement that God abandoned him. Verb azav, a very frequent verb to abandon, forse, forsook him. It suggests what uh, Calvin was desisting uh, would, would imply. God does not operate uh, what he operates in the case uh, of righteous actions, the, the will and, and the doing. Hmm? Uh, I see something of the kind, although it is quite subtle, in uh, the breach of symmetry uh, in Romans 9, verse 22. Uh, the sentence is built in a symmetrical fashion. Uh, Paul is uh, speaking of vessels of wrath and, and vessels of mercy, as you remember. But as to the vessels of wrath, he says that he, he bears them with great patience. Whereas he is actively involved in showing uh, his attributes of, of mercy toward the, the vessels of mercy. And the vessels of us are fitted, fitted unto destruction, whereas the vessels of mercy he has prepared for <laughs> oh, glory. You see the non symmetry within the general symmetry of the sentence. I think this is what uh, the word permission points to a divine abstaining. Does this divine abstaining make certain the moral form? It seems so, if we consider that there is no good except through participation in God's goodness. The whole of the human person is constantly dependent on God, in whom we move, we live, we have our being. If we try to imagine an element uh, in the innermost part of free will deciding apart from God, I think we, we would show ourselves the victims of uh, myopia, uh, being independent of the absolute, is to be absolute, uh, not the God. But then, how should we uh, label uh, thinking of possibilities, since this is our theme? Uh, should we say there is a, a real possibility of certain occurrence? as we uh, forge that category <laughs> uh, for our inquiry. I'm not sure. Uh, the reason is what I said a few minutes ago uh, about uh, God's decree being entirely uh, of another category than ordinary possibilities. 
but also be because this is the opaque mystery that God, who is love, who is sovereign, uh, should permit decree that his beloved creatures, the creatures he has made into his own image uh, as uh, earthly sons and daughters, should choose against him and to their own destruction. How can they? This is the opaque mystery. And I say we don't dispose of it. We are given enough transcendence, <laughs> eternity in our hearts, to be conscious of the question. But we cannot go beyond we don't find the whole work of God from beginning to end, uh, Ecclesiastes says also. And, and we, we are not in a position to speak any more uh, of this. Uh, we'll fall prey to idle talk, and we have to repent on dust and ashes, as Job did if we, if we try. We just confess. Thou canst all. Nothing beyond thy reach. We stand in all. We bow in all. We prostrate ourselves in all. This is prostrating ourselves. But there is a temptation that is very strong at this juncture. The thought at this time is most attractive that we can explain this strange permission of evil by God, a scandal for so many, by the thought that God permitted this in view of the work he was to do, in view of the good he was to draw from that evil, in view of redemption, the greater good. Uh, reason. It is the meaning of the famous Felix Culpa uh, of the Latin hymn that is sung in the Church of Rome from about the year 1000, I think, um, in, the, in the Easter period. Felix Culpa, uh, oh happy, oh blessed, fault sin <laughs> that obtained for us such a redeemer. <laughs> this is extremely tempting. And the temptation is strengthened by the fact that the thought is present in Scripture for particular evils. This is clearly said for the treachery of Joseph's brothers. They thought this whole thing uh, according to the wickedness of their hearts, but God thought them for the good and redemption uh, of the family and even of Egypt. <laughs> See? Uh, so, uh, here we, we have the indication that this particular evil was permitted by God in view of the good he was to accomplish through it, or on the, at least on the occasion of it. And we have a similar statement by our Lord Jesus in John 9 about the man born blind. Uh, he didn't sin. <laughs> His parents didn't sin, but this was that the glory of God may be manifest. So we have an evil permitted by God with that end. It's very easy then to extrapolate and universalize uh, that scheme and say, well, God uh, permitted evil to enter the world, uh, and so Felix Kulpa. <laughs> uh, with a view of redemption, to redemption. But I don't find this in scripture. I find nowhere this Felix Culpa expressed. Yes, after this thing has been accomplished, we marvel and praise God that he has been able to overturn evil and to produce a greater good indeed, add to his glory. But never this is used as an explanation of why he permitted evil to enter the world. 
And I think it does make a great difference between evil uh, as such uh, and as it entered the world uh, in the beginning uh, and particular evils that are channeled under God's government uh, in order to serve also his, his good design. Uh, and so um, I, I think we shouldn't uh, go to this uh, explanation and we should stay with the opaque mystery. We don't understand. I will come back in my third part on what uh, are the implications of this. But now I turn to evil as a human possibility. Prior to disobedience in the state of innocence, original righteousness, I think we can only say that evil is a purely logical possibility, as we said it also for God. It is known through negation of the good, but the good only is real. The name of the forbidden tree implies that it was possible to think of evil. And therefore, I resist antinomian efforts as elimin eliminating moral judgment at that original stage. See this? Especially some Lutheran uh, theologians have tried to say there is no moral discernment. No, uh, they fear more any admission that there was a a moral ability uh, would lead into legalism, moralism, moralistic uh, views. So they tried to eliminate, even Bonhoeffer, this idea from uh, the pre-fall uh, situation. Uh, I don't find this convincing. I think that uh, the knowledge of good and evil means basically autonomy, the prerogative or determining what is good and what is evil. I tried to uh, demonstrate, I think, so this meaning in uh, another book. Uh, and I join in this interpretation a company which comprises Calvin, Roland de Vaux, Karl Barth, Paul Ricoeur. So I think I'm <laughs> good, good company with this understanding of knowledge of good and, and evil. Uh, so uh, this does not imply any real possibility of evil. As to death, the sight of animal death, which I argued is not evil per se, was also enough for the first couple to understand the meaning of the word death. So uh, there is no need for us to posit any other possibility than the merely logical possibility, denial. I criticize doctrine that maintain a tragic component in the original constitution of reality, the idea of the bite of nothingness. Uh, I may mention some other views which I barely had the time to deal with. Uh, the role of the disproportion of finite and infinite uh, of time and eternity. Uh, it is the source of angst in Kierkegaard and a preparation of the leap of saying, oh, the leap is preserved, the quality difference. Yet, there is there some kind of a continuity. This would be also the case with Ricoeur. Uh, one of his books that is maybe less known and read than uh, some others, Fallible Man, also explores the possibility of evil and, and sin and find it in the structure the, uh, of the human constitution. Uh, also, the relationship of finite and infinite, although it is quite different from Kierkegaard's, uh, a disproportion. So uh, you also have a, a metaphysical preparation, a real possibility of evil. This, I suggest, is not really based on scripture, and uh, it subtly disparages uh, the perfect goodness of creation as proceeded from God. 
There is, however, this we, we already saw by, by large, but there is, however, another conception of humankind's original state, which apparently, apparently refrains from a metaphysical rootage of evil, and which can boast of a prestigious pedigree. And so uh, I have to deal with that uh, for a moment now with you. The tradition of free will defense obviously considers that the possibility of evil choice is an essential component of freedom and that it must be reckoned with as a real possibility, not just logical. And this is clearly shown in the fact that the talk is immediately of the risk that God takes when he confers free will. Uh, it is the cost God has to pay if he wishes to receive a free response, as love must be a free response. St. Augustine is at best ambiguous on this, and I think this may be a little less known. Not only in his early treatise, uh, The Libero Arbitrio on Free Will, but in one of his latest works, in his De Correptione et Gratia, uh, of Correction and Grace, which he composed in 427, uh, he clearly states that the first man, of the first man, I quote, he could persevere if he will so. That he did not will so proceeded from his free will. For then he was so free that he could will good and evil. And uh, on this basis, he, draw, he drew a convenient scheme in Eden, you have posse peccare et posse non peccare. Man can sin and can not sin. Possibility of not sinning. Then fall into vin, and uh, it was followed with a situation of the bondage of the will, the servo arbitrio. He coined the, the, the phrase, by the way, uh, before Luther took it. Uh, and uh, then it is non posse, non peccare. Man cannot not sin. Impossibility of not sinning. And then uh, in redemption uh, fully uh, accomplished, then it will be the non posse peccare, uh, the impossibility of sinning. <laughs> this is the scheme he drew. But in Eden, therefore, before the fall, this ambiguous situation, yes and no, both possible. And he drew a, a very complex theory about the role of grace at that stage, which was, at the end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century, uh, a bone of contention uh, between Jesuits and Dominicans. And it was so heated the discussion, the auxilies, uh, that the Pope had to forbid any further discussion on the matter, any publication on the topic. Uh, so uh, Augustine uh, says that in, in our case, the grace given us in Christ, since we are sinners, makes us willing according to Philippians 2.13. Uh, it is an auxilium quo, an aid by which we choose the good. Hmm? But he says not so with Adam. Adam also needed the assistance of grace in order to persevere, but uh, not so determinative a grace. He said free will is enough for evil, but for good it is not enough if it is not helped by the almighty good. However, in the stage of Adam, he didn't need a grace that makes him willing the good. Simply uh, an assistant uh, that he could abandon if he will so. It is called the auxilium, the aid, sine qua non, without which he could not persevere, but which he could leave to the side. You see the subtlety. Uh, we need, because we are sinners, a stronger grace that make us willing. Adam did not. Uh, on the face of it, 
this doctrinal construction seems to grant the decisive point to the Pelagians <laughs> that Augustine was co combating. Uh, there is an irreducible core of free willing that is uh, functioning independently of God. God's assistant is there, but there is still something else. <laughs> this is so surprising that interpreters of Augustine have been divided on the right reading of these passages. Many argue that elsewhere the doctor shows himself so unflagging in his refutation of such a notion of free will, with arguments so determinative of the main belt and mood of his theology that he could not mean <laughs> what he apparently wrote in De Correzione et Gratia. The safer way in my eyes is to keep with the text as it, as it stands, as we read it of that late work, and to admit that Augustine was not able to solve all the tensions in his thought. <laughs> it would not be the only example, in my opinion. Calvin did not take up the discussion de auxilis, but he did follow Augustine on the twofold possibility in Eden. He says very clearly that Adam was able to sin and not to sin. He could lean on either side, he, he, he writes. There is an element in Calvin's presentation which is a bit different than what we find in Augustine. In the humbling tone Calvin uses, he wishes to cast down all human pride. So he says that man was created infirmus and liable to defection. He fell by this infirmity. Uh, he was even on slippery ground. Institutes 1.15.8. Slippery ground for, for Eden. This looks very much like real possibility uh, of sinning in that creation stage. This is uh, combined uh, and with the Orthodox after Calvin uh, generally uh, with the idea that uh, Eden was just a temporary stage in, in, in God's intention. That it was a test, that the command was probationary. Uh, so man had not really fully decided. He, he was uh, in between, uh, and if he had uh, passed the examination, he would have been raised to a high, higher plane. Yes. And this is expressly used as an element of explanation why sin arose. Francis Turretin, Turretin, Turretini, yeah can write, we should not wonder if man, who was created a fallible and changeable being, should have changed and fallen. This is candidly uh, the recognition that a continuity is thus provided between uh, the pre-fall state and the fall into sin. What should we say about that? I stand in the Augustinian tradition. I call myself a Calvinist. But I prefer to keep at a certain distance from the positions I have just summarized. In other words, I'm revising my own tradition <laughs> in, in, on this point. You see? The Pelagian view of free will, despite its, uh, the hold it has on modernity, does not square with biblical evidence for me. Uh, so I'm not uh, allergic on this. But Calvin's language does not suit me. Uh, he, tries, he tries hard to safeguard the, the creation's goodness, but I don't find him convincing when he does so. And as to the idea of a probationary status of what we find in Genesis 2, I fail to see any hint in the text itself. Adam, weak, unstable, on slippery ground? No, not at all. 
He is unashamed nakedness was no inferiority, but the sign of blissful freedom. I suspect that one factor was Calvin's platonic depreciation of the body. Of course, he had to suffer many ailments in his own body. It's, it's quite terrible, horrendous. And definitely there are statements quite negative in his writings. Uh, on bodiliness. So I think he couldn't think that Eden was uh, a final stage. Uh, no, it, it could only be uh, something uh, that should have lasted uh, only a brief, a brief period of time. Berkauer has expressed the same feeling as I am uh, expressing uh, now. No hint that there was a probationary character at this stage. So I cannot go beyond not impossible for evil before it arose. Uh, why and whence did it arise? Then this is the opaque mystery seen from uh, the situation of early, early man. What about the situation? I check my time. <laughs> what about the situation after the fall? This still belongs to our field of inquiry, inasmuch as there are new evils arising, uh, at least from a kind of latency or even lethargy of sin after the pattern of Romans 7. Sin was, uh, as it were, dead, and then thou shalt not covet, uh, awakened it, uh, brought it to a kind of life. In Augustinian terms, now prevails the non posse non peccare, a situation characterized by total depravity in Reformed tradition. I just insist, in order to uh, dispel mis the misunderstanding, that the bondage of the will uh, implies that everything we do is tainted with sin. Uh, everything uh, we do is lacking the true root of. Uh, which corresponds to obedience to the first and great commandment. Uh, and therefore, even our works of righteousness are like filthy rags in the presence uh, of the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 60, uh, uh, 63, I think. Uh, but this doesn't mean that all human works uh, are similarly evil, that there are no differences, that we cannot recognize more righteous deeds uh, in uh, what men generally uh, accomplish. Good works, which are produced with the assistance of common grace, are also recognized. The reformers spoke of civil righteousness. Roman officers in the New Testament are credited of such. And you see, it's very, very interesting. In one sentence, our Lord uh, just said both things. If you, who are evil, total depravity, <laughs> if you who are evil give good things to your children, <laughs> there are things that may be labeled uh, good in, in this uh, uh, situation. Uh, there are acts of generosity, heroic sacrifices, of which we may say that in themselves, in, in isolation, they are good. It is in the context of the whole of moral life, if we ask about the root of all behavior that ought to be total love of God, uh, that we must say, it is still the expression of the evil heart. And in the words of St. Augustine, splendid vices. <laughs> uh, uh, they are goods in themselves. What then should we say about possibility, since it is the category we are trying to apply? Should bondage lead us to speak of necessity? The reformers did, and the Jansenists, and uh, they were condemned in Rome, as you know. I would insist that if we speak of necessity, it is self-inflicted necessity by the human will, not metaphysical. It is 
concretely constituted by uh, pride, by the love of lies. So I think we shouldn't say really necessity, but a better category would be a real possibility of certain occurrence. And a wide range of uncertainty remains, playing, common grace playing its role regarding forms and degrees, and so we avoid necessar necessitarian language. This is what I suggest. So this is the way I would apply the categories we have considered to the situation of evil in relationship to God and to man. Does it bring light on our path? We have not found any answer to the why and whence. On the contrary, our analysis has dispelled suggestions that tended to mitigate the discontinuity of evil arising. I have criticized doctrine of metaphysical evil, of any real possibility of evil inherent in creation, free will independent of God. As we remember the Pantocrator sovereignty, uh, I had to confess opaque mystery. And I see in scripture that this is the right conclusion to draw. In three places at least, I see explicit or at least implicit the teaching that we cannot understand. Uh, there is Romans 9. Paul clearly raises the problem. Uh, if nothing resists his will, why does he condemn and blame? And he does not give a rational explanation. He says, you, uh, uh, some vessel, uh, you cannot understand. You cannot understand. I think this is the bearing also of the construction of the book of Job with the Lord's discourses that don't answer uh, the, the anguished question why. Uh, so uh, I would also say, and Habakkuk. Habakkuk, chapter 1, raises our problem. How can it be that the Lord, whose eyes are too pure to, to look upon evil, uh, are using the, this uh, cruel invaders, how can it be? There is no rational explanation uh, in the answer that God gives to, to his, his prophet. Opaque mystery, but uh, shall we stop at this point? In a way, yes. And there is a frustration. It, it, it is hurtful. <laughs> Uh, there is a natural wish, as I uh, stressed on the first day, for our intelligence to, to see things together, to comprehend and put order, and we cannot with evil. Uh, and I say it is a thorn in the flesh of reason, and it is painful. Uh, yet, I think if we pause to reflect on that situation, we discover that it is a remarkable revelation, illumination, that we gain through uh, its means. Opaque mystery, I use the phrase, uh, to contrast this mystery, why God permitted evil, with all the other mysteries of our faith, the other mysteries are above us, we are dazzled with, uh, with uh, the, the light. But if we uh, attune our thoughts that they conform to scripture, I think we can receive them with great peace and joy. We uh, can uh, sense that there is harmony that is established through them. They are mysteries of light. There is only one mystery that is opaque and so uh, uh, frustrating. It is that which concerns evil. And if we think of what it means, I think we 
we discover that this is precisely the mark of evil. Evil is the alien, the intruder, precisely not created. Our intelligence was made to appreciate the harmony of God's creation, the, the, the interconnection of reality, the entailments. The, and if we succeeded in putting evil in that global order, then we would deny its alien character. We would find a topos for what is a topos, a, a strong the second Thessalonians three, uh, what is uh, evil. Uh, if we were to yield to the temptation regarding evil of our intelligence, uh, yet ultimately uh, to suck out the evilness uh, of, of evil, to bring it back in, in the order uh, of, which is of God's creation, then uh, I think we, we would deny the evilness of evil. And since the first evil to be considered is the evil we do, that means excusing ourselves, excropiting ourselves. Okay. See, you see, we don't understand, but, but we can understand why we, we don't understand and why we must not understand. For this would be denying the evilness of evil. And in this light, all the explanations everywhere in all human-made religions and, and, uh, and wisdoms, uh, I think we find efforts at explaining evil, <laughs> including through chaos. It's also a way of explanation. Uh, dissolving into the, to disorder. The only place where the mystery is uh, absolutely opaque, <laughs> the singularity of evil is uh, preserved in its scandalous uh, character, is scripture. I think this is a, a chastity <laughs> which is miraculous compared with all human attempts. And so it turns to be a, a, a mark of its more than human inspiration. You see how, uh, considering uh, the opacity of this mystery, and it frustrates us, but uh, maybe for us the occasion of praising the truth of our God, and with two consequences. It mobilizes us against evil. After all, if evil was not so evil, why fight against it? If it is part of the global harmony, uh, as so many great thinkers have said, including uh, Augustine, even, even at one point, uh, claims that prostitutes are necessary to to uh, the good order of the world. <laughs> uh, if we were to say so, but then why fight against evil? Okay. But if evil is the alien, uh, uh, what God hates, though he permitted it mysteriously, then we are to fight evil with all, all our strength. <laughs> and not without hope. I suggest that this opacity of the mystery, which is so difficult for our reason to, to accept, it humbles us, it humbles us, it humbles it, is also what provides a sure, solid ground for hope. If evil was not so evil, then why eliminate it? <laughs> if evil was a tragic dimension of reality as such. How could we hope that it will be uh, uh, finally eradicated? But if God is sovereign, if God is fully opposed to evil, then we m may be sure that there will be an end of evil. <laughs> How long, O oh Lord? We have an answer uh, to the, the third question. Uh, about evil. Uh, 
in the last lecture, I uh, intend to develop a little uh, few uh, aspects of this uh, final overcoming and eradication of evil uh, by God. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.